Hi there. I'm happy that you joined and happy that you're here. Uh, my name is Kodruca Bunia and I'm hosting this webinar on the 13 lessons learned. And uh, during this session, you can listen what I'm going to say and you're going to have some, uh, let's say, um, quiz and polls that uh, my colleague is going to, to promote so you can answer or you can put questions. And after the, the session, I'm going to respond to all of your questions that, uh, that you're asking. Okay. So, um, my name is Punia Kodruca and I'm working at Yonder uh, like uh, seven years ago. Uh, and I'm working mostly on the testing part, uh, on the automation side and defining the way of working for, for this wonderful um, domain from IT world. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about 13 lessons uh, learned in automation testing. And I'm going to share you my experiences uh, and uh, what I've learned from, from this part. Um, the reality is that uh, some test automation efforts, unfortunately, fail uh, due, due to some different pitfalls. I have faced different challenges along the testing path, uh, experienced different situations, and I would like to share some of the lessons learned with you. Uh, well, today I have 13, I, I say lucky 13, uh, lessons learned to share with you. Uh, some of them um, were learned on the hard way, and some of them um, are aimed to, to help you also in this extensive trial and error, and also to help you when you're trying to uh, step up in this promise world of uh, test automation. Um, to start with the first part, uh, with the first lesson, uh, is the part where we are, have automation as a business case. Um, for us, it's very important to know exactly what's automation and what's happening in this automation world. Uh, one of these parts is that all of us know that the test automation, in fact, is the use of software to control the execution of tests and the comparison of the actual outcomes with the predicted outcomes. Um, what are the gains for this automation part? So we have early defect detection, uh, which is very important for this part. We have reliability and reusability. And of course, we have automation to reduce our testing time. Um, I've collected some data from the projects in which we, we had in our company, and we come up with some nice graph to illustrate a little bit how we were and what is our gain in time with automation. Uh, you can see the orange line represents the manual part and uh, represents the way where tests are, are involved. And during time, as the functionality grows in the project, the time needed for the manual part, manual testing, the manual checks, uh, increases over time. Increases that we need to have one, two, three, four, uh, or also five tests at some point to be able to uh, execute all the tests. And this is not the, the way we want. In the automation part, we measure that at the beginning, of course, we have, um, let's say, a higher involvement and higher time uh, to be able to set up all the environment, to be able to set up all the framework, to be able to have all the structure in place. But once we have that, uh, then we are going to um, lower our effort and we are going to have a straight line uh, for, for this effort, um, differencing in time based on how much we need to maintain from, from our test. So one of the things that we learned from this part is the automation from the business perspective to understand the gain that, uh, that we have and to be able to use this gain on the other projects. Well, the second part uh, for, for the lessons um, the second one would be focus on the business needs. Um, we as the testers are really, really anxious to start and create an automation and start to write automated this test. Uh, but the, the question that we, we put here is, uh, is this automation test really needed? And this is really needed on the project where we need to, to apply this. And if it's needed, uh, what is the need? And what is the value that this automation will bring us? Um, for, for example, uh, if we are having a complex product, yes, of course, we, we have automation. Uh, but if you are going to have a product for three or four months, for example, do we really need to invest in this automation part? 
do really need to automate. So the idea is to make the balance, why is needed and when is needed. Uh, the second part here would be um, what type of automation are you going to, to use? Yeah, we have the UI automation, which is really the, the nice part, but um, do we really need only UI automation or do we need to focus also on the API part? And we need to understand a little bit what this gain and what this brings us. For example, we can have the UI part, the end-to-end -end test, the reliability, the cross-browser support, but in the same time, we need to see if that is the really val real value that it brings us. And to focus also on the API part uh, and test with API part more the core functionality and to be able to invest more time and to be able to have faster responses uh, automating our backend uh, structure. Um, well, having our, our structure in, in place um, uh, and start automation on specific projects, we usually are in the, uh, let's say, the, um, the balance of, okay, I'm having this already done on this project and work perfectly fine. Now I'm going to use the same thing on the other project because on this side work perfectly. And we have the tendency to have the best practices and put the same best practices on all the projects in which we are working on. And there were some items in which this, this doesn't function very well. Uh, what functions very well on a, a specific project from an automation point of view can be a fail on the other project. Uh, so from this context part, it's very important to have and very important to focus uh, on the context that the product brings us. Uh, the idea is that the value of any practice depends a lot on the context. Uh, we had different projects and different focuses with the, with the projects. And we learned that each project is unique and each project needs to have a separate way of structuring in order for us to have to bring value to the automation part. Um, to be able to analyze the business, to be able to analyze uh, the business of the product, uh, to be able to know very well the architecture and the technology that is used on that part, uh, to know the processes that are going to, to work and the practices, but most of all to understand the people. The people that are working together and the most important, how they interact and how they structure the, um, the technical stuff combined with the functional part. This is one of the, the most important actions to take the structure based on the context that we are having. Um, to go further, um, when we start the automation, understand the context and we know the need, um, it's very important to have in place a test strategy. Um, it's very important to know where we are going. Uh, there were some projects in which we started as a testers. We define our way of working and nobody knew about it. And it was like uh, after one month, it was like a question, oh, you're doing automation, really? You didn't knew that? Um, so one of the most important parts for us is to define a strategy. Uh, a strategy which contains and describes testing approach of the software development cycle and that uh, combines all the activities uh, that we are going to define and describe uh, for the project, uh, mostly to uh, define the risks uh, and to be able to mitigate the risks that the stakeholders uh, are having or we are seeing that we are having in the automation part. And once we have this, to combine together with our development team and together with the clients to make sure that we have the same understanding and we are on the same um, area with everybody and everybody knows what to expect from the automation point of view and everybody can help in case that specific help is needed from, from this part. Um, focus on risks, uh, focus on the mission that we, we aim to have from the automation part, focus on the environment, the testing types that we are going to, to have, how we are going to structure them, um, how we are going to, to provide them and to track uh, the defects that we are going to find during the, the automation process, and to be able to have an approach that is understood and is very shareable with everybody and everybody knows about what's what's happening in, in that part. 
Okay. Um, now we are at number four, um, the POC. Um, this is one of the interesting lessons that, that we learn in multiple uh, cases. Um, the idea to, um, to have a proof of concept, to prove them right or to prove them wrong, depends on the, the situation. Uh, for example, uh, we had a product uh, pro uh, in which was written in Angular. And we said, yeah, well, it's written in Angular. We are going to use Protractor. Protractor is the best tool to, to do this. And we started using Protractor without any analyzing what Protractor can do on that specific uh, product. And uh, after four days or five days in which we read tests, we understood and come up with uh, a specific case in which we had a, drop, um, a drag and drop. And uh, that drag and drop functionality, we noticed that wasn't supported by Protractor in a specific browser. So, uh, and that functionality was the main functionality for our client. So the idea was that we could not use Protractor anymore. So we needed to change that. Um, the idea for the, the proof of concept uh, gives us uh, the, the certainty that the tool that we are going to select for our approach is actually the, the tool that we need. And we need to validate the, the variability of the tool, the data, and the elements that, that appear. Uh, what we learn from this part is that um, for each of the products that we are having, a new product uh, um, that, uh, that we need to approach and define a strategy for, for it, we take into consideration that concept of tool adoption. Uh, the idea for the tool adoption is to, to be able to identify the best tool that fits for us. So in order to do that, uh, we define a list. Uh, a list of uh, characteristics that we will need for our tool. So we, even if it's free tool, it's an open source tool, uh, what uh, platforms it can support, type of application, if it can integrate with a, a CI environment, uh, what programming language does it support, um, and uh, how we can build with, uh, with that tool and different reporting mechanisms and different other aspects in which we would like for that tool. We select two or three tools uh, that, uh, that we would like to use and we would like to try on application. And with those three tools, we try to automate three scenarios. So uh, we select four scenario uh, to be the simplest scenario from, from the application. The second scenario to be a scenario which is like uh, medium and um, uh, most used, but not the most important. And the third scenario that we select to, to prove our concepts and to prove our tools will be the scenario which is more complex, the most complex scenario from the entire application to make sure that we go to all the areas in which are more like complex, not the simplest one. And in this way, the tool that fits better our needs will be the tool that we are going to, to select. Uh, we are doing this for the tools, for the automation tools that we want to use, for uh, specific tools for generating data or specific libraries to create uh, reports for our tests. Uh, and of course, uh, to not forget the elements, uh, the possibility for those tools to identify the elements and how easy it is for, for us to identify the elements using those tools. So for the POC, for us in our experience, was really, really useful to have uh, this, um, uh, this in place. Okay. Oh, so we have at number six. Um, well, one of the things that are useful for, for the automation to get others involved. This is one that um, I think everybody is learning on their own when they are starting. And uh, on our side, it was really uh, nice and really useful for, for me. When I started uh, the automation part, um, I was really, really happy. Uh, and I've created some uh, specific uh, frame and I said, oh, okay, this is perfect. It's, uh, it's, it's something that I really, really um, can do and it's really, really useful and I don't need to change anything in it. It was a couple of, I don't know, seven, oh, eight, nine years ago. So uh, 
Um, and after one month, after I keep uh, writing tests and so on, I said, um, let's, let's uh, take a, a review. And I asked my colleague, when he was a Donna developer, to make a review for my test. And I was, uh, was really happy that I can show him something which is really nice. Uh, and after that, he came to me and said, um, okay, I, I looked over your test and uh, I would like to, to share some inputs with you. And I was like, uh, I don't know if you, you had some experience in childhood when you see your paper from the teacher and the entire paper is only read. Uh, I had that feeling. Um, he made a very strong code review for the automation part and uh, that code review was really, really useful and uh, that really helped me. And uh, that from that moment on, when I'm dealing with these situations, uh, I really try to involve people to, to code review what, uh, what I've done. Uh, to be able to share, uh, share knowledge, to be able to ask for feedback, to be able to improve what we are going to, to deliver. And to be able to create also with automation that so-called quality as a team effort. That was really important. Okay. Number seven is just to keep to keep calm um, and uh, and don't automate everything. There are a lot of things and a lot of people that are saying that um, yeah we have automation we have manual testing now we need to have uh, everything automated uh, and um, yeah you can have everything 100% from the manual test tool to have them automated. The question is. Is this really needed? Um, we, I had some example in the past. I had a, a product, it was a huge product. We had like six main features and we said, okay, we want to automate it and we want, went to this idea to automate it like 90% of the, the scenarios. So we did. Uh, we completed after two months, I think we completed one feature. And after we completed that feature, we started to work on the second. What we notice that uh, even if we are writing this lot of scenarios for uh, our features, uh, even though uh, we need to run a tons of manual testing to make sure that the critical path is completed because all the other five items and features remain not uh, automated. And that was really hard for us to, to keep track. Uh, after another month, um, there were some changes in the UI part and the business part, and uh, we need uh, to go back to our first feature and start to um, maintain it and start to change it. So we weren't there in the, uh, the, um, the structure, but we needed already to, to update our tests. And it was really, really um, uh, hard for us to, to keep track on that. Uh, another part is that uh, when something was um, a new uh, a new code uh, was uh, checked in, we noticed that several tests failed because of it, and uh, it wasn't uncommon for multiple tests to fail for a single check in, and this happened a lot of time. Uh, this meant that there were tens of tests we needed to manually investigate to see if different errors were produced. And in the reality, there was just a single error who made us um, fail a lot of more than 20 tests or something like that. And that was a lot of noise that we added. Uh, why would we need tens of tests uh, that to, to, told, uh, to tell us exactly what is failing? Uh, so the idea was that uh, for us it was too much. Uh, the automating everything might help you and might help you for a short while but the battle but the war will be will be lost because there are too many tests and too many um, tests to uh, automate and to maintain and to change uh, if you are going to automate everything that um, is going to, to be too much and the gain uh, from the automation won't be the desired one the idea what we uh, defined is to go and uh, create and automate the right tests. What does it mean? Uh, to automate the, the critical path, to automate the tests which are used most frequently, to automate the repetitive tests uh, to run on multiple builds, 
and uh, to test what is highly subject to, to human error, what it's most likely to, to fail and to, to be a human error in this, uh, this situation. And besides this, um, this goes very well when we are dealing with new products in which we're starting automation testing in parallel with development. But what's happening on uh, projects which don't have automation and they uh, were written like for, um, I don't know, two or three years, uh, how, we are going to, how we are going to select what to automate. And in that direction, I put some suggestions on how uh, I'm defining this. So I'm setting up um, the list of features. Uh, the list of features and sub-features. Uh, not in very much details, not going to its scenario and so on, but just going to the epic level, let, let's say like this. And for each of them, I'm going to define which of them are needed for automation and which of them are not. For example, uh, I'm taking into consideration how, exp uh, how important and how risky and how much uh, priority has a specific feature. Uh, the second one, I'm taking into consideration how expensive it is to do that scenario automatically. And the third one is how expensive is actually to automate. Because there are, um, there are some scenarios which you can automate them very easily, but there are scenarios in which you need to invest a lot of time in order to, to be able to automate. So uh, from these three, point, uh, three items, I'm giving points to each of them and I'm able to define overall how and which of them I should start with in the automation process and which of them I can start to define the stories in my backlog for automation to be able to start implementing them. So this is the, the way that uh, we, I, I, I try to go further on and not automate everything, but to automate uh, just what is really needed and what is not creating noise when the, the tester is executed. Um, there is a saying, um, less is more. Um, this is one of the things that uh, I also discovered in the, in the automation part. Uh, that uh, having less tests brings us a uh, higher value. Uh, and running less tests uh, and the, the right test will bring us quite higher value. Um, to give you an example, we had like uh, a lot of tests in the CI environment at a specific point of, point of time. And we wanted to provide the fast feedback that the automation brings us in the production checks. Uh, and what's happening is that uh, we had a test execution for the automated test that took a lot of hours uh, to run uh, entirely. Uh, so for, for us, that wasn't as feedback. And we wanted also to, to make sure that after each change in a specific application and specific functionality, we can track that and we are able to, uh, to run the test against it. So uh, we, met, uh, we um, try to uh, mitigate some of the, those parts by uh, adding uh, multiple machines and running the test in parallel. But however, the feedback loop was still what was we didn't want it wasn't helping us enough. So what we did for that, we structured the test in uh, smaller groups based on the type of test we are going to run. So for critical paths, we define specific uh, branch, uh, specific jobs to run in the CI environment. Uh, then for end-to-end -end tests, uh, we define specific um, um, jobs to run that. Uh, we also define one for the full regression path, but we also uh, define the test execution based not on uh, the type of test, but based on the uh, functional area in which the test was uh, provided in such a way that, um, for example, if there was a change in the logging part, uh, then when we trigger the test execution, we triggered the, the smoke part, the critical path, but after that we triggered and were, were able to trigger all the scenarios which were uh, related to that specific logging part. That was really helpful for, for our part. Okay. Uh, the ninth lesson, um, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, there are a lot of uh, tools right now in the market 
And there are a lot of people who say, uh, okay, for, for my specific context, uh, I, I cannot use tools. I don't want to use tools. I want, uh, I will create my own tool. And this is mostly applicable for the backend testing, uh, as, uh, as, I, as I noticed. Uh, okay, I'm just creating some, some calls in Java and I'm going to define for each type of call, I'm going to define my own functions and my own libraries and so on. And that would be helpful, but the idea is that in time, as much as you, you would like to, to make your things working, you are going to create more and more and more functions to, to your tool. And at the end, you are going to be in the situation that you are going to maintain the, your product, you are going to maintain the automation test, but you are going to maintain also the tool that you created. So what would you do that? So one of the things that, uh, that I've learned is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to real, um, realign it and use it better or and improve it uh, based on this. There are a lot of tools in the market and uh, there are a lot of frameworks that are provide, provided by example to which we can uh, inspire and which we can use in our test. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we can take from that and just apply it on our context without reinventing and recreating something which probably won't, won't help us in the end. Okay, number 10, um, have an instrumented code. Um, and what, what does it mean? Uh, make your work easier. Um, I started and worked on my uh, application, the web applications. Uh, with uh, creating and identifying a lot of expats, the relative expats, uh, with axes, with parents uh, for the most complex uh, uh, front end uh, uh, written. And I start there, even if the, um, the code and the identification of the element was very simple or very complex, I just stay there, identify the expats, which after that I understood it was wrong. Um, if you have a product and if your product is starting now and is in development right now, the best thing that you can do uh, is to ask the development, the development team to add um, some specific uh, attributes to the elements in the, in the page. I don't know, like name, like uh, specific IDs or like specific, um, some, uh, some project we just call it uh, attribute out. Uh, and those ones to be specifically defined for the elements that you have in your page. That is really useful and really useful for identifying the elements that you are having in your, in your application and not spending a lot of time identifying complex, complex pets uh, and expats and the way to, to use the, the elements. So as a development team, uh, to have that in place and to help you with, uh, with creating this. Okay, uh, we have the strategy. We have the, the UI defined by the development, we have the way of working and we have everything. One thing that is missing and one thing that um, I found it really, really important and I put it here as being a king is the maintainability of the test. Without this part, um, the, the automation will go to um, um, a certain failure for, from, from the experience that I, that I had. Um, I'm going to tell you one of the, the experience for, for this area. Um, I needed to start uh, as an as a automation person for a specific product. And uh, they said that they have automation and they have a lot of tests developed there. Uh, and I really, really was really, really glad. Okay, automation for that is huge product. I think they were like five teams of something. And uh, okay, let's start. I was really, really anxious. And my uh, happiness uh, was uh, stopped in the moment when I see the, the automation structure. Um, there was um, a record and playback for a framework. Um, all the elements were automatically identified, so some of them could not be actually identified in the, in the structure. They had all of them absolute pet. If there was a change in the, in the application, we needed to change like 50 tests or something. 
uh, when we ran the test, we had like 40 or 50 failures due to the, the code for the 50% failures uh, due to the, the code. And uh, any change in the functionality took us to huge uh, maintenance of the test. So my first week when I worked with, uh, with this, uh, this framework, in my first week I just updated like 10% of the failures. And then we had the new build and after we had the build, uh, we had another like 10% failures, but totally different part of the, the automation structure. So the idea is that um, for us, that way of working wasn't successful. So we started to, to change it and we started to make something which is, was more, more maintainable uh, from, from our structure. Uh, we started to use uh, coding in order for us to, to be able to implement it. Uh, we defined specific coding standards uh, to be able to use for this part. Uh, we use different automation design patterns uh, to be able to reuse a lot of uh, our structure and to be able to um, maintain the test better. Uh, we were able to define a test lab in the maintainability, maintainability part, uh, a test lab where you can have all the time your test, you can run your test, you can structure your test, uh, to have different use of utility libraries to help you in this, uh, this continuous process. And of course, the most important part, to have a test structure, uh, a test framework uh, that uh, will help you uh, structure this. I would like to talk to you more about the test framework uh, and the concepts for the test framework, how you how to define a very nice test framework for, for your use. But unfortunately, I don't have time today, so I'm going to invite you to the next webinar in uh, one month, where we, we are going to talk only about the structure of the frameworks, uh, the main concepts of the frameworks, the design patterns, the usability of design patterns, and we'll discuss mostly in the technical session uh, about this. So maintainability is king, structure, reuse, maintain, and deliver fast, fast the product that we, we are with you. Um, one thing that, um, uh, also, I uh, forgot at the moment, and uh, in general, it's forgotten um, the main maintainability of the test. And the idea is that um, um, every test you automate is one more that you must maintain. So, uh, if we are written a lot of tests, uh, we need to make sure that uh, every test we automate is another one that we need to maintain in the future. Um, each change in application, uh, the associated automated tests also must, must be adjusted to, to the changes that uh, appeared in the application. Um, and for, for this one, uh, to, to maintain our the test, to be aware when we estimate that we don't need to be that optimistic about the automation part because you also need to focus on the maintenance. Uh, and another part uh, regarding the maintenance is the fact that we need to um, take the time to consider when we are going to maintain the test. Because um, as, as the quote says, uh, the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. Um, if we are all the time, because uh, there are some cases in, okay, one test is failing, I don't have time now to, to maintain it, I'm going to comment it, I'm going to maintain it later, and so on and so on. And then at the end, we are going to have a lot of tests which are not maintainable or do we have a lot of situation in which uh, half of the tests are uh, not up to date. Uh, and so uh, specific uh, attention needs to be on the maintenance of the tests, uh, on uh, the structure that we are giving to the test, because those two goes one in hand, hand in hand. Um, and to make sure that if we have a very good structure of the automated test, the maintenance of the test needs to be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. 
well, if you are not going to have a, a great framework structure, hmm, then we kind of lost and the maintenance part could take more than 50 or 60 percent of uh, our, our time. So the idea is to, to keep in track for the maintenance part and also to keep in track for, uh, for the structure of the test to, to be maintainable all the time in, your, in the structure. Okay. Going further, <laughs> the the lucky the lucky part uh, would be to treat your automation code as a production code. Um, so, if we are having bugs in the application and we know about those bugs, so we don't push the code into production, or we don't push the code without someone else uh, reviewing the code, we fix it first. We take a look over it and we make sure that everything is working. So the same thing we need to do uh, with automation because we, we cannot trust uh, on something that is going to check the application and gives the check to go into production if you are not going to keep that at the production quality. So for, for this one, we need to make and apply the same ways as we apply for the others. Uh, automation is not an instant fix, so we need to focus on, on this part. Uh, and also we need, in order to do that, we need people with software development skills and people who understand very well the testing mindset, testing automation mindset, and that's one of the essential part. And uh, we are doing so for, for automation, we are doing so, so focus on the automation mindset for, for the people who are not involved in the automation area, and then focus on developing the software skills that are needed uh, for, for doing so. Um, nevertheless, automation is one of the important parts and uh, is one of the most important parts that uh, we have in the testing. Um, it sometimes is hard to be implemented and sometimes, yes, can, can, have, can be expensive, but uh, it's more expensive. We are not going to use it in our products. Uh, so that, that's what I've learned during the, the time that we have more uh, expensive, it, it will be more expensive, we are not going to, to use in our products. Okay. So to sum it up, those are the uh, 13 lessons learned in automation testing for today. Uh, and put them all together with the business case focus, with uh, focus on the business needs, focus on the context, uh, the final strategy. Don't forget about the proof of concept. Uh, don't forget to take others uh, with, to help you in the process and to share the information. Um, don't automate everything. Uh, in include the less tests uh, in smaller pieces of data. Don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, have an instrumented code and ask your developers to help you with that. Uh, maintenance is king, so it's very important for you to have a good framework for that. So we can talk about that in one month from now. Um, uh, to focus on what is needed to be automated and to, to keep track that we need to treat our automation code as production code. Um, one of the things that I want to say uh, before going to the Q&A session, um, uh, these are the few of the hard lessons that I've learned from my experience and the things that I work with. Uh, I learned uh, throughout my journey that test automation and I'm very curious what experiences have you had um, and what uh, where they led you. Uh, so if you have uh, the need to do that, please don't hesitate to share that with me so you can write to me uh, about those and we can share ideas uh, and we can compare notes uh, based on the um, specific um, uh, areas in which we were involved. Um, you are also um, uh, desired to ask the, the pool that was, was defined and answer which of the lessons uh, you find useful or which of the lessons you would like to reuse uh, further on in, uh, in your business. Thank you very much. Okay, I see you answered the, the pool, it's really nice. Okay. 
Okay, and I have some questions here. I have like six minutes to, to answer. Okay, let's start with it. Uh, have you thought about cost of testing? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, we thought about the cost of testing, cost of not having testing, and the cost of uh, um, putting the product in production without the cost, without actual uh, uh, actual testing. Um, and um, well, we noticed that uh, if we are not having it, we are not um, finding a defect. Uh, it's going to cost much more than if we are going to find it. There were some sp uh, statistics that says that uh, on the testing part, if we find the code, the, the defect during development, it costs like, like uh, 10, 50 euros. But if you are going to find it in production, uh, that is going to impact the client, then it's going to cost like 1,000 euros or something. Depends on the criticality of the defect. Because if it's going to find in production, then, uh, well, we need to go back in the testing to fix it, to reproduce it, to test it again, to put it in all the environments, to be able to go in further. And that's going to take uh, a while. No, and if not, saying that may cause impact to some of the clients. Another question, what do the use uh, the use to automate testing? Well, uh, that's a very nice question, uh, but depends a lot, uh, Alexander, the, depends a lot on the, um, the product that we are testing. Uh, and depends a lot on the testing that we are having and depends also on the um, um, technology that the, the testers are using. Uh, the developers are using. Um, for example, I prefer, if I need to give some names of the, of the tools, I prefer Selenium, uh, even if it's a uh, Selenium web driver, even if, if, even if it's with C Sharp or Java code. Um, that's for the UI part. I prefer Rest Assured uh, or the um, similar with C Sharp language for the, the REST part, for the APIs. It's really useful and really nice. Uh, I use TestNG or JUnit or NUnit for the assertion part. Um, and if it's the case to have uh, behavior-driven development, I prefer to have Cucumber. And if it's the case for performance or for so specific uh, part for the REST testing, I uh, prefer to use JMeter. Um, another question about test coverage. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, okay, uh, do you have a preferred automation tool? I think I answered to that one. So those are my list of preferred tools from, from uh, all the list. Um, question about test type, do you use BDD unit testing? Yes, uh, we use BDD on specific projects. Uh, and use, we use behavior driven development and we tried also to include and involve the entire team to, to go to this part of BDD. Um, uh, do you use Open Edge ABL unit testing? Um, I haven't used it, Open Edge ABL unit testing, but I think some of my colleagues uh, who are on that part are using it. Um, in your opinion, it's okay to skip running tests if they fail for known issues bug, especially for bugs that will probably not be solved in any future. Uh, yeah. Um, so one one is to to skip a specific test because it's failing because you, you did not update it in your automation suite. That's uh, that's one part. But if you are having a bug which all the time is failing and failing and they are not going to fix it, uh, you can skip it and you cannot put it in the execution round uh, because you don't want to just to scare you all the time. You can just simply not execute it. That, that's okay. Uh, it is good practice to tie tests between them or you make them independently all the time. Um, uh, I make them independently all the time. Um, the idea is that sometimes I don't know exactly even if I'm having, if I'm having 10 tests, that's okay. But if I'm having 100 tests, uh, I, I won't, I, I don't know exactly which of them can relate to which of them because there are too many to for me to, to know. So the, the, for this one, uh, I try to make them uh, independent as possible in such a way that uh, um, I don't know exactly which of them is going to be executed before which of 
uh, them. So make them independently for, from my point of view. How do you collect uh, and report all the automated test results? Um, we, we tend to use uh, sometimes the part with the CI environment and try to integrate it in the CI environment. If not, we are using some libraries which are additional to the automation part, uh, which are creating very nice reporting and very nice graphs to all the automation suite. Uh, and uh, that is really useful for uh, for for test, you can write an email. I, I'm forgetting now exactly the name of the library which I'm using, but uh, if you write me, I get. I'm going to send you exactly. Uh, oh no, it's extend reports. I remember the extend reports. Uh, what is a defect for for me? Um, well, for me, it's a defect. It's a malfunction a product which is not functioning exactly as I uh, expect to function after I deliver the product to, to the client. Um, what do you use for testing API in Java? Um, API testing for me in Java, rest assured. Really useful, really nice. I recommend it to you. Uh, if uh, you don't use rest assured also um, jmeter can be a solution and soap ui can be another solution but rest assured is 100 percent java so it's really nice um, shall developer write test cases um, well we usually uh, we use on our side the test automation is really is written by the testers, but there are some cases in which the developer uh, can go and help the testing team uh, if it's needed. So we have situation in which the, the team helps uh, the tester uh, and write some tests. Uh, and there are also situations in which the, the tester, um, the, the developer helps a lot the tester in identifying and writing more complex scenarios. So we tend to involve also, also developers when one is the case. Um, you are doing also QA management or just QA uh, control. Oh, well, um, uh, I'm, I'm doing both. I did both uh, and uh, yeah, both. Should be QA as department subordinated to the IT department or to the product, uh, to the product department? Just your opinion on this. Um, well, um, I, uh, I, my opinion, my opinion is that uh, the QA department should not be uh, subordinated to the, um, the product department and not to the IT department. Uh, my idea is that all of them needs to um, collaborate together uh, and to, to be able to invest more in what they, uh, they learn and to be able to collaborate more in this, uh, this uh, part. Um, the QA part, the testers, needs to be more involved and needs to take input uh, from the product department, and that's for sure. Um, they just get input from the IT department from the technical point of view, but the changes in which they need to, to, f to follow into creating and following the, um, the application functionality, that's the product department. But I don't see them under subordinated. I just see them together collaborating. Um, okay, uh, what automation design pattern were used? What formula was used to complete the overall score from prioritization? What's automate? Um, well, uh, as design patterns fans, uh, I'm suggesting it, it's, uh, I'm not sure if I can answer to that today. I suggest you to join the other part in one month. I'm having the, the session only on the framework part and also only on design patterns to help you with, uh, with that direction. Uh, in deciding what formula was, uh, was used, 
Um, well, you can compute your own formula based on the importance that you are, you are having. So when you have the, the scope, yeah, okay, you have the priority and then you have the uh, time for automation and you have the time for, for manual testing. And based on type of the application you have, you can together or you own, you can define your, your formula and decide uh, upon, uh, okay, I have a one and then something very, very important. And if I'm having something which is really, really hard to implement from the automation point of view, then I'm going to leave it. Uh, for example, we left some scenarios uh, which were priority one. Uh, we did uh, we did not automate it because in order for us to automate it, it took too much time. So we decided not to automate that. So it depends a lot on um, the business and depends on the project. I cannot give you a straight formula that depends also on how you would like to, to define the formula on your side. Hope that helps. <laughs> um, a good practice for a new developer is start with testing. Um, well, I, I I don't I won't say that to start with testing. Um, another of the very nice uh, thing that we had um, with the new developers uh, was uh, to make them a, a session to understand better the the testing concepts. So we had like a session with all the the new joiners, new junior developers in the company, and we had a session with them about the benefits and the challenges for the testing, how a tester needs to approach a specific business and so on. And that really, really helped them a lot in understanding and seeing the testing perspective and being able to help the testers when they, they need it and being able to collaborate. Um, it's very nice for the test developer to understand the testing concepts, but I'm not seeing it as a developer that needs to start with testing specifically. Um, it's more like uh, knowing the, the concepts, but not put him, put him as, a, as a tester. Oh, okay. So I think I answered all the questions. I hope I did not forget. Um, mm, Okay, but if you don't have any questions, uh, I would like to thank you for being present here. Uh, and I'm going to wait for you for the uh, second webinar, which is going to be from one month from now. It's about the, the concepts for the um, uh, framework part uh, and best practices on the framework structure and how to, to be able to uh, to use them in your uh, session. It will be a more a technical session with more examples from the coding part. Uh, so we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.